Hey everyone, welcome to the first video in my Sustainable Concrete series. My name is Nikola Tosic and I'm a teaching assistant and PhD student at the University of Belgrade's Faculty of Civil Engineering. I study and research concrete structures and sustainable concrete composites and in this series I would like to talk to you about exactly that. My plan is to, through a series of short videos and presentations, present the current environmental problems posed by concrete production, potential sustainable alternatives and the work I'm doing at my faculty as a member of the Concrete Structures Research Team. In this introductory video, I wish to lay out all or at least most of the current problems that the production of concrete raises, mainly concerning our environment. In doing this, I will try to avoid using any jargon, but where necessary, I will do my best to explain the specific terminology sometimes used. Before I begin, however, I feel a slightly more detailed introduction is needed. So, I live in Serbia, and specifically in Belgrade, a lovely city of around 2 million people, and trust me, if you ever have a chance, come and visit us, you will have an amazing time, I guarantee. In Belgrade and in Serbia, the oldest and largest university is the University of Belgrade. Founded in 1808, today it consists of 31 faculties, 11 research institutes, several centers and libraries. You have an option of attending over 400 study programs and be among the almost 100,000 students taught by more than 6,000 academic staff. I put a link to the university's website in the description, so feel free to check it out for more information. One of the faculties at our university is the Faculty of Civil Engineering. It was founded in 1846 as an engineering school and became a faculty in 1905. We have well over 2,000 students studying different courses and modules, such as structural engineering, project management, hydraulic and environmental engineering, infrastructure and others. Also in the description is a link to our faculty's website, you can take a closer look if you're interested. And finally, this is the research team that I'm extremely proud to be a part of. There are currently five of us, we are headed by two professors and three of us are doing our PhDs. I will come back and talk about our team and our work in more detail in a later video, but for now you can visit the link in the description where you'll find out more about us. So now I can get back to the main topic I want to talk to you about and that is the problem of the sustainable or rather unsustainable concrete production. In order to do that I'll try to connect a broad view of the sustainability and sustainable development movements so to speak with a specific and narrow topic that is concrete. The history and evolution of the term sustainable development is long and complex but it can definitely be said to have entered mainstream discourse after the 1987 report Our Common Future published by the UN's World Commission on Environment and Development, the so-called Brundtland Commission. Since then, sustainable development has become an ever-present buzzword in both academic and non-academic circles. So far, a large body of literature has been produced that analyzes sustainable development, criticizes inherent contradictions and problems with its mainstream interpretations, and theorizes alternative approaches. Participants in these discussions are academics, activists, government and supergovernment policymakers. It can be noticed that, although slowly, a shift is happening towards the realization of the very proximate planetary boundaries to economic growth and development, whether they are material or social. Because of this, alternative social and economic systems have gained prominence. These range from the steady state and degrowth economy theories to environmental Marxism. For some of the ideas that I find very interesting, you can find the link in the description. Without going into too much detail here, for our current needs, we can think of sustainability as requiring compliance with three imperatives. The ecological imperative, to stay within planetary biophysical carrying capacities. The economic imperative, to provide an adequate material standard of living. And the social imperative, to provide systems of governance that propagate the values people want to live by. Unfortunately, today it can hardly be, be said that the construction industry globally is satisfying any of them. Often we take some things for granted or don't give them much thought, but when we analyze them in more depth they can shock us. So is with the construction industry, and the fact that it has one of the largest environmental impacts among all human activities, and annually it's responsible for 40% of raw stone, gravel and sand consumption, 40% of total energy, 25% of virgin wood and 16% of water consumption in the world. Within the construction industry, concrete is the most widely used material, with the global annual production of an astounding 20 billion tons, or 8 billion cubic meters. Traditionally, concrete is a composite material, made from coarse and fine aggregates, held together by a binder that hardens over time. Most often, natural river sand and gravel, or crushed stone, is used as aggregates, and lime-based cements, such as Portland cement, as binders. 
you can see a typical composition of one cubic meter of concrete and the resource requirements on your screen. So there you can see water, aggregates and cement in their usual amounts. Of course, this enormous annual production of concrete requires an equally large consumption of its component materials. Global annual consumption of aggregates is around 15 billion tons and of cement 4.2 billion tons. Environmentally, the production of concrete is a significant burden that has been studied extensively. The most common approach is to employ the so-called life cycle assessment methodology or LCA, which is a methodology for evaluating the environmental load of processes and products during their li life cycle. It has been employed to show and analyze the emissions to air, ground and water arising during concrete production. One of the most important impact categories in LCA is the global warming potential expressed in grams of CO2 equivalent, which is kind of a compound metric of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. This impact category can also further be related to damages to human health, relating the CO2 equivalent amounts to the so-called disability adjusted life years, which is a World Health Organization metric which signifies how many years of healthy life have been lost. To find out more about LCA and these metrics, you can visit the links in the description. For the production and transport of one cubic meter of concrete, on average around 300 kilos of CO2 equivalent is released into the atmosphere, and cement production makes up 90% of this quantity. This is because during the production of one kilo of cement, between 700 and 900 grams of CO2 equivalent are released. This release actually amounts to 4.4% of global annual emissions by industry. Although cement production technology has been improving, there is a physical chemical barrier to reducing the emissions during cement production. Namely, a part of cement production is the production of the so-called clinker at temperatures of 6 to 900 degrees, during which CO2 is necessarily released, as you can see from the equation on your screen. It is obvious then that the cement industry is a very large and significant one. The annual production of cement of 4.2 billion tons in 2014 is up from 4.1 billion tons in the previous year, with China and India being by far the largest producers, with production taking place in over 2,000 cement plants. You can see a list of the top five cement producing countries, as well as companies on your screen. The largest producer, Lafarge Holzim, is actually a product of a $47 billion merger of French Lafarge and Swiss Holzim companies as the European response to China's domination by its corporations. So as you can see, the largest producers of cement are modern global mega corporations, carrying with them all the economic and societal implications of such organizations. Besides these problems that arise from concrete production, there is also the problem of the end of life stage of concrete structures. Concrete structures are usually designed for a service life of 50 to 100 years, depending on the intended use of the structure. With most of the developed countries' modern housing and infrastructure built in the period after World War II, this means the end of life is near for a large number of concrete structures. This poses the problem of construction and demolition waste after their demolition, of which concrete is a significant portion. In the European Union alone, 850 million tons of construction and demolition waste is generated annually, which accounts for about one-third of the total waste generated. However, the most common method of dealing with this waste is still landfilling, giving rise to land use, environmental and human health related problems. So these have been just some of the main issues of concrete production that I've tried to highlight. Even if it might seem a little intimidating or depressing, you shouldn't feel that way because, as we'll see in the next video, several ways forward exist that can help us solve and alleviate these problems and hope for a better and brighter f future. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Please write your comments and questions below. I'll be more than happy to read them and answer. And I'm looking forward to preparing the next video of the series, where we'll see what can be done to make concrete more sustainable. And finally, what we're doing right now in Belgrade to make it happen.